Right, so we are here with, introduce yourself. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. <laughs> Jermaine Jackson. <laughs> now it's Cam and Rick of Massacre, right? Um, two of you have a long history, very long history. Uh, now you're back together. How did this come to be? I mean... Love. Love. <laughs> Sex. Sex. Porn. Porn. Yeah. Producer call and ask. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I gotta be serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. seriously. How did it happen? Uh, I don't know. It's like one of those synchronicity kind of things. Fate, I guess. Rick called me up. Um, actually, uh, 2016, I believe. Was that 2016 or 15? 15. Yeah. 2015. Um, and uh, just kind of out of just ask me if you know Facebook. Actually, social media. That's let's go there. Social media was how it all got pulled together. Yeah, we didn't have each other's number. And uh, basically, he was in another band at the time, asked me if I would like to come and, and maybe on stage and do some songs, some masker songs. And it had literally started like that, just coming out and, with his other band and doing some of the songs on stage while his other band played. And we, that went so well and it felt so good that we decided to, got to talking and decided, hey, well, let's try to do this you know, for real. And we started getting going, and of course, got a big speed bump in the road. That, uh, you know, I don't want to linger on that, but basically we got told that we couldn't do it. Uh, some of the other former members pretty much just said, no, you can't do it, uh, name, you know, trademark, blah, 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 all this stuff. So we had a couple bumps and stuff to get through, and name changes, and a bunch of crap that we weren't really happy with, and a lot of bands have to, you know, deal with that nowadays, and it's really sad that if you would have told me back in 1985, 86, when we started this, that bands would be fighting over their name, I would have laughed at you. But uh, sadly, that's happening, you know, today in metal, and it's really in many in many levels of music. Yeah, many levels of music. It's it's it's, it's a sad. There's no thing. money in this level, you know. We're not but going to win. just to get yeah, yeah just to basically bring it sum it up. There was a lot of trouble with trademark and stuff until finally. We, we, we settled back, we decided after doing a couple of different name changes and stuff, we just took a back seat, took it easy, just said, okay, let's just let things calm down. As soon as things went to the, where uh, they dropped the ball, basically, I picked the ball back up. And got, Rick and I got back in touch with each other and we said, let's do this now the right way. And that's exactly how we've been doing it since then. So what is your plan of attack, basically? Uh, you play in live shows. Is there anything else going on besides any music written? Oh, well, we're, like we're we're considering it. We're talking about that. We're seeing how we're doing this retrospective thing first. Seeing how the fans have been. Now, of course, this is our fifth show. Yep. Fifth show. Four sh four out of those five sold out. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we're doing something good, um, and uh, it's something that people want to see. So that's what we're we're going to do. Is we're we're going out doing this retro thing, showing people, you know, what it was like. To, you know, back in, especially now that we got Mike Borders back in the band, so we got the original bass player back in the band. We're showing people what it was like, you know, in 1986, 1987, when we first created this music. And we're hopefully, as old men, bringing this raw feeling still to the stage now and letting fans that weren't particularly around back then or weren't even born back then get in the opportunity to actually see it and experience it for the first time. And those older fans that were back then that may not been able to see us or catch us during that time to be able to experience it and of course the fans that saw us back then getting to come and see us again so that's basically what it is right now it's a big retrospective thing you know the, the old school death metal is coming back in and, and it seems to be getting more popular again you know like it's coming full circle and I think we're just doing this at a good time coincidentally time. yeah because it would have happened if, if Michael Boris would have said no mm -hmm. he basically I gave him a phone call and he said, oh, if it's fun, I'm in. And he doesn't have to do it. You know, he has a living and so and, and, a, and he's married and he's doing it because it's fun. What so, kind of a feedback are you getting so far? Seems to be really, really good. Yeah, we, know, been, we haven't had anything thrown at us. It's been a know? really good good feedback, I think. It's, it's been a very positive thing, which was really, we didn't know what we were going to step into. We really didn't know at first if we were going to step into something where people were throwing, you know, rocks at us on stage and booing us, or or we we're going to step in where we're getting really good reception. And so far, everything has been really good reception. And the more people are finding out, like I said, the show sold out. The more people are finding out about it, we're selling shows out. So that means people want to see it. I think at first, 
people saw it as like, oh, let's see what it's going to be. How like. long is it going to take for this to fall apart? Yeah, how long is it going to? No, there was very, now, there was a negative thing. But now people are actually seeing that it's a positive thing, seeing that it is working, and we're doing very things professionally. You know, not only outside of the band but within the band, and it's a very positive, and it feels right. It's the first time I think Massacre's ever felt right. Because everybody's involved. Everybody knows everything that's going on. No matter the small little level, but you, all it is when I'm making a bunch of money, we're definitely not doing it for the money. You know, whatever shows we're doing is probably helping us from our days off from work. So which so. aspects of being in Massacre are, are easier now? Uh, I would say... Communication for Communication, one. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's definitely, in touch. Yeah, definitely communication. Mm -hmm. um, communication is, is, is key. Also, uh, so Dave's there's, there's, there doesn't, there's a trust thing that doesn't feel like there's something going on hidden that's agenda. hidden agendas. It, it all feels like something, because we've all come to this basically with a you know, blank slate and put everything's out on the table and as we said, you know, this is how we're going to approach it. And every one of us are approaching it and when we don't, we all decide together on everything. Nothing is ever decided outside of anything, right. we all throw it back and forth. And that's going to transpire, that same kind of trust is going to move over when we start writing music, when we start, you know, and yes, there is plans to start writing, we've been discussing that. I mean, we, have, we literally have two songs that we yeah. can't have recorded already from from before this hasn't been released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. so we have new material that we're talking about, and we've also been talking, you know, when we start writing new material, what how we're going to approach it. Mm -hmm. So, Are there any challenges? Any challenges? Challenges would be that we're old and probably leaking from our bladders a lot. Um, uh, the smells, the smells are challenging because we're older now, and uh, there's a lot of older smells. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, biggest challenge is probably getting the time off of work. But we, me and Maz work with Mazzanetto, the drummer, have a really cool job in the same place, and Cam used to work there too. But he's taking care of some personal stuff, and will probably come back as well. So we're. They're, able, they're letting us do this because they know it's not going to, we're not doing this for 10 years, you know what I mean? We're doing this to have some fun with cool people, everybody that we've been worked with, with all the promoters and everything, it's been really, really good, so why not? You know what I mean? If we're able to get off of work and I'm not losing my day job and I can go have some fun with some friends and rekindle friendships and write some music together and the From Beyond stuff is sounding as best as it's ever sounded because the, the proper guys on vocals and the proper guys on bass, so it's, it's fun, it really is. Speaking of proper guy on vocals, uh, your last version of Massacre was missing that. Was Cam your missing link? Uh, yeah, but it, that was a mistake, but I'm really happy that he wasn't involved with that. Because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be involved with what he did before. The only thing that I did where I pushed the envelope a little bit is that we actually put a record out, and I regret that. Other than Mike Mazzanetto, my, my good friend, was playing drums on it, and it's, it's, we did a good job. We wrote everything on that record except for the lyrics. So, but yes, that was... The missing that this should that shouldn't have happened, but it did. And it's the same thing. Same people were involved. Same there was hidden agendas and things kept bad. It was not what it is now. Okay. So. Uh, let's talk some history. You guys first met in something called Mantas. Yeah, something like this. I something think. like that. Yeah, that actually was a release. So. Um, but this is this is the this is the the commercial release. This isn't the original the commercial release of of this, but. It's got it's got some cool stuff. It got my artwork in there at least. Mm -hmm. You know, got some of my artwork. Of course, you know, this isn't gonna save my artwork, but you know, it's my artwork. It is. I watched him draw it. Yeah. You know, his logo. Yeah. But so, what do you remember from that time? What I remember from that time. Um, we did form it before Church uh, of Premature before. ejaculation. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so was, we were young, uh, uh, going through puberty, uh, finally getting, you know, pubic hair. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Uh, not, I remember, you know, it, it was fun. We were kids, though, and then that's the thing, you know, we were teenagers. Teenagers, it, but, uh, Manus, 1983, when Rick and I started it, moving into 1984 when we met Chuck and everything. If you were to say, now, you know, this many years later, that has the impact that it did, I wouldn't have thought that it was going to have the impact that it did. I was a punk drummer. You know, I, was a, I, was, I was, wasn't even really into metal. I didn't get into metal until I met this guy. Um, I, I was more into punk and hardcore uh, music, and um, when we started doing this, we were just basically emulating Venom. Uh, that was the that, that was the main main influence for Manus was basically take. I mean, the name comes from, of course, yeah, you know, Manus, the guitar <laughs> right, player. The and uh, 
So we started off as sort of a Venom sort of band, emulating Venom. You know, we, we played a lot of Venom covers. We did Poison and Teacher's Pet and songs like that in the beginning. Um, and it was first it was me and Rick, and we, we went through a lot of, before Chuck, there was a couple other guitar players. Who's that one guy's name that we broke and played all those songs? I don't know. I don't remember his name, but you know, there was the guy that, he liked Angel Witch. I do remember that. Right. He was like a really big Angel Witch fan. And we had a couple other guys, and they just weren't fitting. And then Rick went to a party one night uh, and met Chuck. And he called me up the next day and said, hey, I met this guy, you know, that likes the same kind of music we like. And the key thing that really, that hammered it in was, was Rick said he's got a garage. Because mm -hmm. basically, we, we he offered. Out. He said, "Chuck just said, hey man, I got a place to jam. You bring your drums, bring your stuff over. And, okay, mm -hmm. it was an invite. Yeah, we, we literally, we were it literally, every day. it went. And you got to remember, this is we're teens. So, Sixteen. Yeah, we're when we're teenagers. Days now we're older. Weeks go by, and you and your life it doesn't matter. But when you're a teenager, three days go by, and it seems like a lifetime. Rick meets Chuck on a Friday night." calls me on a Saturday and then we get together on a Sunday at Chuck's house. It seemed like a, an eternity. It seemed like an eternity, but it was only within those three days. No, that we were excited. To, to celebrate, I think we went the next weekend, but we couldn't do anything during the week, but then the following weekend to celebrate getting together, because the first time we got together, of course, we just hung out, we talked, we didn't really play, right. we just did a few things. The next weekend to celebrate, we all went out to the drive-in theater to see the movie Evil Dead. And that was basically the one of the first songs we started writing was Evil Dead. We had a couple other songs. We had songs that you brought over, which was like Demon's Flight, right, Mantis, Mantis right. and songs like that. We played those, but the song first songs we wrote together, now Chuck had Legion of Doom riffs, and then you guys worked on it together. And Correct. We, we created Legion of Doom. Correct. But the actual first song Wrote together as that the three of us was Evil Dead mm -hmm. and Death by Metal. Chuck right. had Death by Metal riffs. Correct. He started playing the riffs. No, correct. And just like he no, he wrote that whole song. Yeah, me and him did um, worked on Evil Dead in his room. Yeah, I would do the hammer on part, and he would do the chords, and we worked it out together. And then we'd have the double cassette player, and we record it that way, and then we yep. play it for you. Yep. <laughs> so, in his room, every we spent a lot of time in that house. Yeah, yeah. We, at, at that time, did you realize you were onto something special? No, mm -hmm. no. If, like there, I said, there wasn't even. If thought. you would have told. Ass told me back then the impact that it has today. I would have laughed. At yeah, it. that relapse no records way. was going to put this out. Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, no way we ever thought of that. We didn't even realize. We just we were emulating stuff we liked. Basically, like I said, started off with Venom, and then going to Chuck's house that weekend. With Chuck was was tr uh, buying a lot of stuff through Combat uh, Records. The the he had, huge, metal. he had a huge metal connection and for sure. <laughs> All we, we he got Show No Mercy, mm -hmm. and we all went in his room together and listened to Show No Mercy for the first time, and that's when we said, "Wow, let's, we've let's got to do something we've got like to amp this. it up. We've got to amp it up, and 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 get play like this." It was, so it was, but it was with the different vocals, so. yeah. So it, it was a combination of, of you know our influence was a combination of Venom, the the Overkill cassette. Yep. We had the demo Overkill demo, uh, the Possessed demo. Chuck got the Possessed demo, correct, and. Um, other stuff, you know, Anvil and bands like that, that was just, you know, Raven, stuff like that, you know, more of the speed metal, thrash, destruction, you know, right. a lot of German thrash. was. We loved all that stuff. Yeah, it was a variety them. of everything. But we were doing our, our own thing from little, we had our own influence meets originality going for sure, but as far as thinking that it was anything, oh yeah, no. Because it was like Kill 'em All, great record. No disrespect to Metallica. When Show the Mercy came out, I was like, well, I really didn't listen to Kill 'em All much anymore. I was really focused on speed. I wanted to play fast. I wasn't worried about the solos and, and learning how to sweep and yeah, I used a broom to do that and all that other stuff. So it was just just a simple thing and Cam's punk influence, which Dave Lombardo from Slayer, that first Slayer record, single bass, and yep. he's a very punk influenced drummer, it was kind of the same thing. And then it just evolved. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It evolved and Chuck went his own way. They stayed anyway, go ahead. He mm -hmm. knows it better than me. Well yeah, you, you know, uh death Basically, we we're Manus, and then you know broke up for a week or two. It wasn't even like a like two weeks. They they, they it, the media makes it like a big change. It was like a week or two. I mean, and your kids. It literally was a week. Yeah. Or two. And then we get back together as Death. Uh, Chuck you know, changed the name. Chuck changed the name. It was because, his idea. Yeah. And Cam's and logo. Yeah. I came. I drew the logo, and uh, you know, um, 
created the logo and the ad book. It was working better as death because it, it, it was working because we weren't we weren't under the shadow, we weren't Manus anymore, so we weren't under that venom shadow anymore. Mm -hmm. So death was and we now, started fresh with Chuck and we had no problem changing yeah, that. No, we didn't complain no. about it one bit. We thought it was great. Yeah. So we, we redid the Death by Metal demo. Correct. Because the Death by Metal demo came out first with us as <laughs> Manus. So Correct. we redid it, uh, at adding Power of Darkness, I Correct. think. And then that's when it was at the official. And we actually re recorded all those songs. Was Witcher Hill in there? No, Witcher Hill didn't come out until okay. the okay, Rain no, of Terror. No, 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 you're right. Yep. So we did that. And then within a matter of time, it just felt when we became Death, everything started working better. Because now we had our own identity. And we, I remember from that point, we, got, we said, okay, we don't have to be like Venom. So the satanic lyrics went away. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and then I said we're going to do more of the horror. And the Slayer thing was an influence because they were satanic. Yeah, we were going to. We didn't take anything on that. Well, we're, I think we. I was writing more horror. Totally horror. So it's like it sounds like Slaughterhouse. Chuck was kind of on the horror thing a little bit. Yeah, too, yeah. At the beginning. At the beginning. Yeah. You know, I wrote Slaughterhouse, which is basically Texas Chainsaw Massacre song. Correct. I wrote uh, Witch of Hell, which is a there's a super, there's a 1980s horror film called Superstition, which is about a witch getting burnt to the stake. So that's where Witch of Hell came from. Uh, there was. Uh, uh, Curse of the Priest, mm -hmm. which is uh, basically Gates of Hell, which he turned into Regurgitated Guts later. Correct. That was basically oh, uh, Fulci, right. Fulci's Gates of Hell, or City of the Walking Dead, depending on you know where you saw it. Because hmm. um, you saw it in Poland, so it would probably call something completely different. But here it was called Gates of Hell. <laughs> yep. Um, so there was a, I had a lot of the horror influence. I'm still a big horror fan. I, if you ask me what do I like more, uh, here's a good way. What, if I have CDs, my death metal CDs and my metal CDs, and I have a whole entire room of horror DVDs, VHSs, and Blu-rays. You ask me which which collection am I going to give up first? Uh, take the music. I'm <laughs> keeping my horror. I'm a horror fan first. Right. So when did your association with Chuck end as Death and Mantas? And it it basically ended first with Rick. Rick, mm -hmm. you know. I was like go. Yeah, Rick got fired, fired or you know, fired. left. Fired. Uh, That's all right. I stayed in the band. Um, Correct. I stayed with Chuck. We started, just kept working on stuff. We played a played a show. Now, after Rick was, you know, fired, Chuck was in touch with two important guys to this day. You know, it's very important. It was Matt Olivia and Scott Carlson of Repulsion. But back then, they were in a band called Genocide, and they were from. They weren't living in California at the time. They were Michigan. living in Michigan. Yeah. yeah. So they came down, and they were gonna—they uh, were actually gonna join the band. And they came down, and we worked on a few things. And I think when they came down, they didn't have any equipment. They just came down. They were staying at Chuck's house. They didn't really have any equipment, so they came and listened to a couple of rehearsals. And believe it or not, Chuck and I played a show, just Chuck and I, and it was opening for the band Battalion of Saints. Yeah, we went out, and uh, I remember. I still did vocals, and I still played the drums, but they didn't have a boom stand. So Scott Carlson and Matt Olivia switched on and off holding the mic stand for me while I sang. There's, an, there's a video out there, it's a very rare video, and it's on YouTube, really messed up videotape, and the, the guy standing way in the back. But it's me on drums, and it's of that show. And you can hear some of the, some of the songs. You can't really see anything, because like I said, the guy's standing in the back of the club, and there's nobody, there's no audience, there's <laughs> no crowd, a few people walking back and forth. This part of the... Um <laughs> show that we did a three piece with Tempter. Yeah. On on YouTube too, but it's all like distorted like a mm -hmm. old horror film where you can't see anything. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. There was a Night to Columbus hall. That was yeah, our Night to first Columbus. show. Yep. Now, Chuck is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Um sadly gone. Um I know there might have been some differences, you know, over the years. Um were you able to put your differences uh, aside uh, when he well, was Rick sick? and Chuck definitely Ill. uh I did, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to really to, to do it, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people want to know this, and, and I've gone on the record before telling us, what, you know, like, Rick was fired. What happened between right. Chuck and I? What happened between us? It's as stupid to say it now, and you get it, and you get it, but it was, we were kids, again, teenagers. It was over a girl. That's exactly what it was over. There was a girl that liked Chuck. She had expressed liking Chuck to me. I told Chuck about it and said, hey, you know, you should, you know, make a move. This girl was very well endowed. You know, when you're a teenager, you know, and this girl's very well endowed. I made the stupid mistake of saying, which I always do, I always put my foot in my mouth because I just talk, I talk the truth. And I said, Chuck, if you don't go for it, I'm going to. Well, that really pissed him off. 
He completely got pissed off, and he said, that's it, you're out of the band, you're fired, I don't want to see you anymore. And I said, really? Prior to that, though, four days before that, I was living with Chuck. He kicked me out of the house for eating the last bowl of Apple Jacks. I ate, was eating his apple jacks. I sat down. His mom came out and said, would you like something to eat? I said, sure. She offered me the apple jacks. I started eating the apple jacks. Chuck came out of his room, saw that I was eating the apple jacks, completely flipped out, started screaming at his mother and started screaming at me. He says, I cannot believe you gave him the last apple jacks. And he kicked me out of the house because of that. I stayed in the band. It was another four or five days. I said the thing about the girl. That's when he got rid of me. But I think he was mad about the apple jacks. <laughs> I think that's what it was. I think he was really mad about the Apple Jacks, he and he just, used, he, he just used the girl as an excuse to get rid he of it. He was very peculiar. Yes. <laughs> Let's just say yes. that. Yes. Rick, anything else to add from your point of view? Um, I've experienced not on my with him personally, with myself, but I've seen similar things that he's talking about. Not the Apple Jacks, but with like things with girls and stuff, and him firing people over that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. Yeah. But no, that's nothing against him in a bad way. That's him. You know. I mean, I'm going to say it, you know, and I go on the record, I mean, and, I mean, and I'm not talking those. about him. And, you know, people have to understand, when you say something, you got to remember, I'm talking about a 16, 17-year-old Chuck. I'm not talking about Chuck the man. I'm Correct. talking about the teenage Chuck that I knew. He lived with him. I lived with him. You also have to talk about a person who, who at the time, he was very coddled by his mother. And, he, and when, you, when you come in a situation like, because he had an older brother that died, and of course his parents coddled him. And because his older brother had died, which is yeah, makes sense it to makes, me. Yeah, so, okay, let's embrace this guy. Yeah. So he was very coddled by his mother and very spoiled. I don't know if that uh, that kind of stuff at a teenage level, and that's going to train, that's going to transform you into the man that you become. Now here's a guy that never in his entire life me. worked a job. He did work at Del Taco once. Well, yeah, that's not a job. <laughs> Working at a taco place is not a job. But you know what I mean. And yeah. so I mean. You got a person who goes, and I'm not, again, I'm not talking bad about the guy. No, That's no one not is. what I'm saying. No one is. I'm just, yeah, I'm just saying that I knew him as a teenager and a very hot headed, short tempered, spoiled kid. And that's what I'm saying. So that's what I kind of a person that I, because you got to look at this one. He, he really did play a power trip. It was his house, his garage, his band. Things had to be his way. And that's the kind of he never said that to me. That that's was after the kind of pressure that he would put on you. Mm -hmm. At least he did it on me. Well, you live with him, so that's a different yeah. thing. That's a whole different ballgame. Any mm -hmm. type of thing with the girl, and yeah, yeah. I had never had anything with him like that. Mm -hmm. But I did get to run into him and make my peace with him if that's what I was doing. And uh, he wasn't doing very good. He told me all about his surgery. He showed me that he didn't have a scar, and we sat down for probably three or four hours. Didn't talk music at all. I actually had a couple of beers with the guy, and we just were talking about. What he was going, what he had gone through, and that was that. Two weeks later, a month later, I ran into his sister at the FBI. This club was no longer there, and she told me he had a relapse. So, but it was a really good talk. You know, I, he never, we never had anything against each other ever. Never had anything against Cam. I freaking quit the band we were in and brought the drummer and bass player into death and didn't say a fucking word to this guy. Hey, dude, um. I don't want to jam anymore. I'm, this is over. We're not doing the. Me we're at it's the Megadeth um, Overkill show. We're supposed to play Megadeth and Overkill. I'll make this quick. So, anyways, uh, we didn't get to play. We brought all our gear, set up with a promoter, and I guess some management thing. And this other band called the Necros got to play the show. During that, I obviously was there and I watched Megadeth. And I, you know, with Gar Samuelson, and it was the original Megadeth lineup, from the first record, the second record. And Overkill was a big fan and watched the show, watched the Necros, didn't bitch or anything. And out of the blue, this guy that I couldn't recognize, didn't know his name, came up to me and goes, Hey, you know Chuck's coming back in town? This is right before Christmas, 87. Yeah, right before Scream Bloody Gore was complete. Yeah. Okay. I went to his house the next day. I left there, didn't tell anybody a fucking thing. I went home because I lived in Orlando. We were in Tampa. I drove home. And uh, the next day I showed up at his parents' house, where he lived, right? where Camp used to live. He answered the door, kind of bewildered, looking like, what the fuck are you doing here? It wasn't really bad, it was just kind of like, oh. And I was like, dude, I got some stuff to talk about. If you're interested, I know that Reifert's not coming into town. No, I didn't even tell him that. I just said, I have some stuff to talk about. If you're interested in hearing what I have to say to you, give me a call tomorrow. He did. 
I got together with him. I told him what I had heard, that Chris Reifert wasn't moving to Florida because he was 16. He was still in high school living with his mom. I lived with my mom, so shit, a long time, So, <laughs> which I'm not making fun of living with your mom. But we're talking teenager, once again, a 16-year-old in high school, did a record with Chuck and didn't want to come to Florida. So I basically told him, without telling this guy, hey, man, I got a band. <laughs> and I... Which I did see in Milwaukee in 87 at the Metal Fest. And I reformed that band with those guys, and Chuck accepted it and let it happen. And on the record, I'm not going to mention their names, but I never got a thank you for that. Hey, dude, that's really cool of you. Yeah, they were freaking giddy like little schoolgirls that they're freaking playing to death now, and they, we have a record to learn. That, Anyways, yeah. But there's, there's no thanks, man. No thanks at all. Zero, zero, forever. Even into freaking Massacre 14, no thanks, zero. My, of course, Mr. Mazzanetto, who's drumming with us and has been drumming with me for nine or ten years, thanks me all the time, and I thank him. Cam thanks me. Thank orders. People thank each other. Hey, you do something. Hey, cool, thanks. Get this for me. Yeah, it's simple, man. It's not because we're older. I probably would have done that when I was younger. But it was different then. It's, yeah, I don't know what it is, you know what I mean? Because I'm not kissing his ass, I'm not kissing Mass's ass, I'm not kissing Border's ass. We're just freaking getting together, and if it sounds good, we're going to continue. Obviously, it sound like shit, everybody be like, all right. <laughs> Which we've had some boo-boos. We've, I've hit bump notes and done this and done that. And... Well, always, it was always right. rough. You're always going to hit rough spots when you first, you know, bringing it back. Anything, anything. So let's get to Massacre. When yeah. did that begin a, as a band? Well, that was. Hey, be, uh, that would be. You mind, if, you mind if Mike comes in first? Of course. Hey, Mike. Mike, we're on a subject that you need to be talking with Mr. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Borders are coming. So we're we're coming up to the point where how did Massacre come about? Oh, okay. So yeah. the Borders would be the very first person. This is Mike Borders, uh, he's the original bass player of Massacre. He's going to be better to tell you this story because <laughs> it started with him, actually, with him and, and Billy. What would you like to know? When did Massacre begin? Sometime early 1985, um, I was playing in a band with uh, Greg Gall, who uh, he became the drummer for Six Feet Under, obviously. And Billy Andrews, who was the first drummer for Massacre, had just broken his band up as a way to get rid of people in the band he didn't like. And Alan West, who was the guitarist for Massacre at the time, came to play with me and Greg. And it wasn't working out. The next thing you know, it's like, y'all need to come play with me. So me and Alan stopped playing with Greg and started playing with Billy again, and that's when it took off. Yeah. And then, pretty much how I came into it, probably. Yep. Oh, we had this wonderful guy that really thought he could sing. Not me. Not, not him. Yeah. No, he, really, he wanted to be like the next Don Dockin, believe it or not. He was trying to sing these thrash metal songs. So that was awful. We found out from some friends that Cam had moved into town. And Bill's like, we got to go get him. So we drove over there. Like, Cam, come, come check us out. We'll practice tonight. We'll come hang out with us. We went over there. Got him. Went to practice. Nobody else showed up. Me, the drummer, Bill, and Cam. Well, let's practice. And, well, let's play like Black Magic from Slayer. Everybody knows that. But you got to mention that there was no PA. There's no PA. And so it's freezing. It's actually a very cold night in Florida, which is weird. We're in Billy Andrews garage. And it's bass, drums, and Cam screaming. Black Magic. And we're like, giggly. He was so like, all right, this is cool. This is what we want to do. And we just, from that moment on, we're like, all right, we're going to start getting heavier and heavier. And that's what happened. We started weeding out the people that didn't fit in with that mindset. And a couple months later, we went to Orlando and said, hey, Rick, come check this out. <laughs> Next thing you know, he moved to Brandon, too. We were all playing together. Yeah, pretty much like I said, I, I went over there, they came and got me. And uh, I was, I had moved to, uh, from Orlando to Tampa, I was living with my aunt, just because I got, I left Chuck, I was living with, you know, Chuck, and I got kicked out of his house. So I had no place to go, I was kind of homeless for a while, living in the streets, the whole dumpster, you know, diving and stuff, and I was like, this sucks. Yeah. And uh, I, I moved, and I left, I, I sold my drums, because I was like, you know, I got no money, so I sold my drums, and I said, like, I don't want to play drums anyways, I want to be a front man. I moved to Tampa, I was living with my aunt at the time, and uh, you know, like I said, they, they found out I was there. I'd only been there maybe a month or so. And uh, I was, you know, really wasn't thinking I was going to get back into music at the time. I was just, 
and I went over to their place and like it was Bill's garage and they brought me in and they, they, they played an original song and they said well, well what others they, they had a couple like anthrax songs and I said no I'm not doing that I'm not doing anthrax I said they said they played an Exodus song. I said okay well we'll do that and they did Piranha but they had no PA and I said you know what it doesn't matter just turn down a little bit I'll scream it and I screamed without a PA I used to practice without a PA with them. That's how it all started. Uh, and like you said, we started writing original music. Uh, Alan had a couple of riffs, and J the other guitar player, JP, had a couple of riffs. And we just started writing. So the first demo, which is Aggressive Tyrant, Death in Hell, and, and Mutilated, those are, those are songs that Alan and, and all of us wrote. And of course, you know, Alan didn't work out because even back then, Alan liked to, uh, I think, drink a little bit too much. And uh, so he was asked, we would go to practice and Alan wouldn't show up. You know, it's kind of hard to practice when your guitar player doesn't show up. And that got kind of frustrating after a while. So I, I said, hey, I know a guitar player. And I, we went and got Rick. Because Rick, Rick was in, uh, yeah, Rick, was, Rick, Rick could, was not doing anything. And, yeah, I went and we, and we went and I said, I told Rick, I said, hey, you know, come on, I got a band, this band's working out. And so Rick moved out to Brandon too. And pretty much, Massacre from that point, we just it just started happening faster and faster. Uh, we started writing, what did we write? I think we wrote Cryptic Rose. The first song, the first song we wrote together was Clanger of War. Clanger of War, yeah, Clanger of War we wrote. And then, uh, you know. We actually played a couple of the old, all of the Power of Darkness. We Power played. of Darkness, we yeah. played that, we played Corpse Grinder, of course. Yeah, Corpse Grinder. We still played a couple covers. Yeah. And it just, it happened really quickly. Like yeah, everything just was really... Six months later, we recorded that yeah. second demo. Yeah, it was it was happening really fast. Yeah, we did, you know, and then that second demo, what there was uh, Cryptic Realms from Beyond. No, Cryptic Realms wasn't on there, remember? That's what we did Oh, face. yeah, we, we, did, we didn't do it. So Chamber of Ages, From Beyond, Symbolic Immortality. Clanger of War. Clanger of War. Yep. But we did do we did do cryptic, but I didn't finish. I get to do the vocals. It was nothing but bass and drums and scratch guitar drums. Yep, that's right. That's right. I liked. It. <laughs> well, yeah, I've always liked bass the sounds great. I like the raw stuff. But yeah, that's how that's how that that all started happening. We were playing a lot of shows too. We were getting a lot, and it was crazy because we were. It was '86 and '87, and we were playing shows. You know. Obituary were called executioner, so we're you know they were coming to play. We, we had Morbid Angel was opening for us. Yeah, we had Morbid. The Morbid Angel was opening for us. Uh, we've had shows where Morbid Angel opened for us. We had uh, shows where we did that Rocky Point Beach Resort. Everybody, Hell Witch was there. Executioner, executioner which is obituary. Havoc. The Havoc. Uh, Morbid Angel. And Dave Vincent wasn't even in the band at the time. Yeah, that's when Dave Vincent was first coming to Tampa and wanted to. Dave, Gork Records. Gork Records. Yeah, Dave Benson had moved to Tampa and he was hanging out with, oh, I got this record label. We're associated with this big label. We're going to put out all this stuff. It's going to be great. You're going to be famous. And he really obviously wanted to move in and take, move into a band. And that's what he did. I mean, he came in, nothing ever happened on anybody. No. No. Morbid Angel even Gork? No. No, well, I think they did like a seven inch maybe. <laughs> maybe released a seven inch and that was about it. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, they, he took he, he came in and he took the guy, he took them all to North Carolina, and they all disappeared in North Carolina, and we were still going except, around. Except for Mike Brown. Yeah, we were still going around there. No, Mike Brown went with he them. Did. He, yeah, he went to North Carolina with them, and uh, we were still going. And I remember we would get a lot of shows opening for like we opened DRI, yeah, uh, twice. Yeah. Uh, we played with Nasty Savage a couple times. Yeah, Nasty Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> There was a there was a bunch of shows we, we were we just were playing we were any chance we got yeah any chance we got we were just playing shows a, a lot a Belching lot penguins. yeah any anything and a lot of a lot of shows that we played we were playing we were mix shows a lot of, yeah. a lot of hardcore punk bands and and us, which was fine by me yeah, I didn't absolutely. I didn't mind that at all but absolutely I liked when the skinheads yeah. started coming to our shows yeah I mean they taught those little skinny kids yeah hey, this is why this is how you throw down up there yeah and it was uh, a lot of fun. And it, it just it just evolved from that, and then again, like Rick told you prior earlier in this in this interview, uh, the bands. We, Mike was asked to leave from Billy for no reason at all. Well, the, the reason was basically to get Terry in the band, his best friend. So Mike got kicked out uh, at a really weird time because we were just getting ready to set up a tour, like our own self-promoted tour of the East Coast. Terry comes in the band really just. You know, it's just kind of just lumbering along, just hitting open notes. 
and we went on that tour. And that was in 87, a self-promoted tour. We went all up the East Coast, all the way to New York, and, and came back and drove, and Robbie Goodwin was yeah, in Robbie, Robbie. Robbie's car. We drove and uh, dragged a U-Haul behind us and went to all these little places and played this tour. It was that tour when we came back, we were taking a break is when Rick took the guys and took off and went and did leprosy. But, uh, and, and you know, of course, a couple years went by after that. So? You know, Rick we got kicked out of death again. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, he comes in and he gets, he comes in, I guess this is 1989, towards the end of 89. I, and I remember I was in another band at the time called A Porn Existence, which is ironically with the guys in Druid Lord, Pete Slate and those guys. And it was my first band they were in. And I was doing that stuff. And Rick got in con contact with me and said, hey, you know, I'm out of death again. I got these other musicians. And believe it or not, Rick got Joe Cangelosi from Whiplash. And he had Butch Gonzalez on bass and and he had all those songs written which was the second coming so and they came they presented the music to me it was already they already had a lot of the music already done and they presented it to me and i wrote lyrics for it joe cangelosi helped write one of the songs lyrics for it and uh which was the cycle brain trip and then um from that point we, we did the demo live and then eric was showing interest at the time and eric heard those songs and they said no we don't want this we want the old massacre. <laughs> Somehow it just worked out that at that time, uh, I guess Bill had contacted Rick and said they were kicked out of death. That was after spiritual healing. True. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, two weeks, we go from two weeks. They contact Rick. I have no idea what's going on. Rick comes and tells me, "Hey, Bill and Terry are coming back, and we're going to do the From Beyond material." I'm like, "Okay." He goes, "But we have two weeks to learn it." So they learned it for two weeks, and then we went in to do this album. That's exactly how it happened. What do you remember from those sessions? What I remember from this album was it was very rushed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very hard for me to listen to it because there's so many mistakes on it. Most people don't know it, but I hear it. Oh, yeah. And especially with the tempo, <laughs> the drumming is really bad on this. I mean, it's all up and down. Um, so it, it's, it's rough. But it was, what I do like about it is the fact that it's raw. I do like the fact that it's raw. He and really that, likes the artwork. And I hate the fucking artwork. <laughs> I fucking hate this album cover. I, that's the one thing I've never... This was supposed to be the album cover. This was what was presented to me to be the album cover. I like this one. I didn't mind this. But then, in the last minute, Rick is not in here to say that, but Rick and P Billy chose this without me knowing. And the next thing I knew when this came out, I was like, what the, the hell, hell is that? that? <laughs> But I at least got to pick this one. Okay. I got to pick that, so that was... Uh, are you much happier with the sound and the overall feel of the EP? Yes, I am. Okay. Other than the fact that Cronus sang all of Warhead and I was put, I was pushed in the back. Because uh -huh. Cronus was just supposed to be the backup singer. But Cronus came in and just, being Cronus, decided to take over and do it. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not going to sing this all. But it's, it's fine. It's still good. I'm still happy about it. I'm still proud to have done it. But, um, yeah, overall, I like the, the, the rawness of this. Other than uh, Provoked the Cursor was actually recorded during this session. It just it didn't come out to, to this, because it came out as a 7-inch, special 7-inch vinyl with this. But then they released it again on this. And how was it that after the EP, things came to a head? Um, we toured this, we toured this in 91. The EP came out and then we toured again, we, and Steve Swanson was at it. Uh, then we toured again, we came over to Europe, and things started going bad even back then. Uh, I don't want to talk bad, but you know, things were getting kind of like, mysteriously money was disappearing and stuff like that. It, 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 it's sad to talk about when money disappeared, but this is our livelihood. So when money starts disappearing, that's money out of my pocket, money out of Rick's pocket. We played in London in 1992, the last show, and I turned to Rick and I said, there's $3,000 missing. And, and we, and the band, the other guys, you know, who are remain unnamed, didn't want to, we didn't talk, they didn't want to talk to us. And I told Rick that night, I said, I quit. I walked off the stage, I said, I quit, I'm done. And uh, he said, okay, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to the airport now. And he said, well, I'm going to go with you. So Rick and I just left and we went to the airport. And that, that's basically what happened after this. And then um, that was it, I went home. 
I, I went home. The other two guys, where the three thousand dollars was missing, ended up going on vacation in France. No, it's kind of you kind of guess where the money went. But um, after that, uh, a couple years went by, and I didn't think about you know I wasn't even involved in music anymore. I was just you know doing the job thing, working the job thing, trying to be a kind of official adult and work a real career and stuff. And Rick contacted me again. Which is about the album we don't have to talk about, which you didn't bring, thank you. Um, I was thinking about it, no, I promise. No, no, no. I hate that album. Yep. Actually, how that, again, just like the second coming, Rick yeah, presented me with music. Yeah. And uh, he presented me with um, music and members, and he said, hey, I got these new guys, you know, I got this new music. Uh, would you like to come and check it out? And I, I said, sure. Now, the funny thing is, if you look at that album, there's, there's the song titles. There's song titles on that album that were my original song titles. Unnameable, The Suffering, uh, stuff like that. These were, they had different lyrics at the time. But during the time when I started writing it and the other members, there was a time where I was told in a corner after the, it was all made to go record. They all cornered me and said, we're not doing Death Metal anymore. And I was like, what? They're like, you have to change the lyrics. We have this concept we want you to do. I fucking hated it. I didn't even finish the album. In between somewhere, I don't remember, in recording it somewhere, I quit. I walked out of the studio. I said, this is fucking horrible. This is trash. I quit. And I left. That was it. It was just embarrassing. That was in 94. They didn't release it for two more years. It didn't come out until 96. It came Ricky, out of like nowhere. Yeah, out of that. nowhere. I had quit. I walked out. So they, you know, they got someone else to come in and finish it. You know, which you can tell if you listen to it, it's not me. You can tell somebody else is on there that, that finished it. And a lot of it was my raw vocals that I went in and did scratch tracks. A lot of it just raw scratch track vocals. They just took the best of what was me and spliced it in there. It's horrible. It's awful. It's, it's, it's worse than it's my cold lake. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and I guess that brings us to the end, right? Yeah. Because we began with what's going on now and we cover the history. Um, when you reflect back at all these things you have done, what do you think of? It's, 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 it's nice to finally be getting the recognition now. It's at least I'm alive and getting it. And I didn't have to die because I wouldn't know fucking shit because I'd be dead in a grave, you know, or in an urn or ashes thrown into the ocean or whatever. But um, so it's good to get recognition now. It, it's, it feels nice, you know. I sometimes feel a little bit like, God damn, it took a fucking long time, but you know, at least, it, yeah, at least we're getting recognition now. So it's nice, that, that's, that feels good. And it feels good that you know you get, you get recognized and people come up to you and go, man, like you know you're 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 here here doing this and people come and say, you're such a big influence on me and you can't believe how much you know we listen to you guys. So that's cool and that's 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 nice. That's a nice thing. It's nice to get that. You know, I'm not a none of us are egotistical, narcissistic rock stars. I hate that kind of attitude and I'll never be that way. Uh, I'm just a guy that was lucky. I just anybody else, anybody else that was playing. Like I said, we were just at the time. It was the timing was right, and we were just yeah, doing right. stuff that we enjoyed. And the fact that it influenced so many people to this day is just—it's really—it's humbling, and it's—it's it's, it's a nice—it's nice to find out that we did something that so many people enjoy. Think about those people upstairs paying to hear four guys in their fifties yeah. play songs they wrote 32 years ago. I know when they were 19 yeah. in a garage. I know. That's crazy. And half these, I bet you half these kids haven't, they weren't even born. Yeah. That are coming to see it's tonight. crazy when you think about it. Yeah. They're like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want me to sign these? I noticed you have everyone else.